blooming war's over. It's over. War to end war. The world celebrates peace. Peace for all time. But there is still a shadow. The unheeding world neglects the first signs. But little by little, the shadow grows. One man, one man alone, has dared to forge anew the dreadful forces of destruction and unleash them. How has this thing come to pass? Adolf Hitler was born 51 years ago in Austria, near the German frontier. He is still very young when his father died. In early life, he is sickly. But by the time he goes to school, he's sturdy enough, just like any other schoolboy. Who could imagine that young Adolf at seven would have developed into this 25 years later? At the age of 19, without waiting to get his diploma, he leaves school and takes the entrance examination for the Academy of Painting in Vienna. He failed. He returns home to find his mother seriously ill. Death soon takes her. Adolf Hitler is left alone, friendless and without means. At the age of 20, he finds himself among the pitiful army of the unemployed. He tries his hand at art again. He paints watercolors, which friends try to sell for him in the cafes of Vienna. Not successfully. <laughs> He takes copies of old masters and forges names to them. Yet for all this, he earns only enough to keep himself from starvation and to find a bed at night in the Doss houses of Vienna. He's 25 years old, this Austrian. When Kaiser Wilhelm II of Germany decrees the war of 1914, the Kaiser promises, I shall lead you to an era of wonders. Wonders indeed. Germany invents new war horrors. First use of poison gas. Frightfulness, they called it then. Flammenwerfer by the Germans. Germany invents air raids, a nightmare legacy for all mankind. Twelve hundred men, women, and children drowned. Sprolos versunken, sinking without trace. Another German invention. Hitler had dreamed of military glory, but again he must resign himself to obscurity. Along with Germany, his country is defeated, is ruined. And he himself, after four bitter years of warfare, has gained nothing but a corporal strike. One other thing. We see for the first time the moustache, which was later to become... And later still? Hitler is 30 years old and a failure. So he must have remained. But the ex-Kaiser's era of wonders has turned out to be an age of grinding poverty and chaos. And it is this situation that gives Adolf Hitler his chance at last. To avoid their just payments, appropriate punishment for their crime against humanity in 1914, the Germans resort to inflation. Money melts like snow. In 1920, the dollar is worth about 10 marks. In 1921, 100 marks. In 1922, 1,000 marks. In the spring of 1923, 100,000 marks. And in the same year, millions and millions of marks. Until we reach the astronomical figure of 4 billion marks to the dollar. Inflation cheats the Allies, but it also brings ruin to Germany. The moral fiber of the whole nation is set. Evil soil, but fertile soil. For the coming sowing of the seeds of Nazism. Hitler has by now become a secret agent. In other words, a spy. In the service of the Reichswehr. Hitler has been entrusted with the task of watching the activities of a new political party, the German Workers' Party in Munich. And while still in the pay of the army, he first joins and then takes the leadership of the very organization he was paid to spy upon. He changes the title to the National Socialist German Workers' Party, which is speedily contracted to that word of dire meaning. Nuts! In 1923, the wretchedness and discontent of the people are at their worst. It is on November the 9th that Hitler and his associates, including the famous General Ludendorff, 
decide that the moment has come for them to make a bid for power. They are so sure of success that they draw up in advance the proclamation that their provisional government will make to the people after their coup d'etat. But the coup d'etat failed. The Nazi ranks waver and break. On the eve of the rising, Hitler had sworn to do or die. I have bullets in my revolver for my comrades and one for myself. If we fail, he declared. It was just a promise. First of so many. He failed, but he did not kill himself. He ran away. But he is caught and put on trial. The sentence is five years imprisonment in the fortress of Landsberg. But his treatment is by no means severe, and he uses this enforced leisure to write his now famous Mein Kampf, Germany's Book of Doom. Outside the prison walls, the situation continues to cause alarm. It is feared the communist propaganda will ultimately triumph. Those who had supported Hitler before, captains of industry, financiers, generals, unite to obtain his freedom. It isn't Hitler they are concerned about. They want to create a diversion against the menace of the red wave. He is released from prison to find that his backers are readier than ever to give him help. And so begins that era of power propaganda that eventually makes Hitler not the leader of a party, but imposes him upon a whole people. Leaflets, pamphlets, books, an avalanche of words and promises. The German loves the uniform. So Hitler gives out uniforms. Uniforms for everybody. Uniforms for boys. Uniforms for girls. For journalists, for motorists, workmen. Whole factories are made over to manufacturing Nazi uniforms. Newspapers are required to spread the doctrine. Nazi cigarettes are introduced with pictures of the leaders on the cards. And the factories where the cigarettes are made belong to the party. The sales of cigarettes, uniforms, arms, insignia, flags, bring in over 70 million marks a year. All profits for the party. The Nazi party. Like a quack selling a panacea at a fair, Hitler makes the Germans believe that the Nazi policy is a cure for all their ills. He promises everything to everybody. And all the time, the big parades go on. Bigger and always bigger. So that the people in their wretchedness, hungry and unemployed, swarm in their thousands into the Nazi organization. The brown shirts become an army, the private army of a single man. A man who aspires to become dictator of Germany. Dictator of Europe itself. But many serious Germans still hold him suspect. The problem is solved in one stroke, the Reichstag. Germany's parliament building catches fire on the night of February the 27th, 1933. A few days before the so-called elections, which were to confirm or otherwise Hitler's accession to the chancellorship. The communists are proclaimed the culprits. Hitler and his men declare it was meant to be a signal for a Bolshevist revolution. It was, of course, necessary to produce the actual perpetrators of the fire. So a young Dutch halfwit named Marinus van der Ruba, found by the police in the burning ruins... Although there were no witnesses to his arrest except the police, is made the chief incendiary and put on trial. The others arrested are three Bulgarian communists, Dimitrov, Popov and Tanev. He really surrenders when he hears he is accused of complicity. The trial is a mockery, a solemn legal farce. Van der Ruba has to... One day, Van der Lubbe shakes off his torpor. How many more times have I got to say it? Yes, I set fire to the Reichstag. I've said it hundreds of times. This has been going on for eight months now. This torture. I have no strength left. I can't stand it. Yes, I set fire to the Reichstag. I did it myself. Now sentence me and leave me in peace. Van der Lubbe is condemned to be beheaded. The others, except Torgler, are set free. So Hitler is confirmed as Chancellor. He announces his policy. To the workmen, more wages. The employers, no strikes. To the small shopkeepers, legislation against the big stores. To mothers and children, protection against child labor. Promises. 
promises that would place a whole nation in chains of slavery. The parade madden public acclaim him. Ovation succeeds ovation, but his megalomania is still not satisfied. One obstacle yet remains in the way of his ambition. Hindenburg is president of the Republic, and it must not be forgotten that Germany is a republic. The old marshal is a legendary figure of the Great War, a national hero, a national idol still, and behind him is the German army. Is yet untouched by the taint of Nazism. But Hindenburg is old, very old. And Hitler knows he cannot live much longer. So he decides to become president too. And thus sole ruler of Germany. Then to remilitarize the nation on a scale never before known to mankind. First, however, he must deal with trouble in his own ranks. He hears of plotting. Hindenburg named General von Schleicher as his successor. Hindenburg has no love for Hitler. He despises him as a gas man. General von Schleicher and Captain Ernst Röhm, swashbuckler and pervert, join together in a strange alliance to overthrow Hitler. Hitler acts, as always, instantly and without mercy. General Goering is given the task of cleaning up Berlin. And his first target is the man who stands between his teeth and the final fulfillment of his ambition. seen nothing, you've heard nothing. If not, victims are hounded out and shot down in scores. Some are told that their arrest was a mistake. They are freed. Shot oh. while attempting to escape was the official excuse. Hail Hitler. Hitler sends me that. Yes, he hasn't forgotten you were once his friend. It's very nice. He wants to save you the fate usually reserved for traitors. He doesn't like to think of stormtroopers walking around boasting of having shot the great Captain Rome. You mean he wants me to commit suicide? Well, I won't take it. I won't make it easy for him by committing suicide. You will tell him he'll have to murder me too. He'll have to finish the job himself to make it thoroughly worthy of him. I don't want his mercy. I want a dozen bullets in my guts, like my friends. I'd advise you to think it over. no master of the situation. And within only a few weeks, Hindenburg has the good grace not to exhaust his rival's patience. He takes leave of life on the 2nd of August, and prolonged obsequies are ordained, culminating in the funeral at Tannen. The German papers that announced the president's death at the same time published the text of a law adopted the day before. While Hindenburg was still living, decreeing Hitler president and chancellor the same day, German troops are compelled to take a strange new oath. An oath of fidelity to Hitler personally. I swear by God this sacred oath that I will render unconditional obedience to the leader of the German Reich and people, Adolf Hitler, 
the Commander-in-Chief of the Armed Forces, and that I will, as a valiant soldier, at all times be ready to stake my life for this oath. And while the German people mourn the passing of the great marshal, the Austrian upstart secured himself finally in position as head of the German state. All that remains is the election. To confirm his succession, the people must decide. A foregone conclusion under the mass attack of Goebbels' hysterical propaganda. Hitler is duly confirmed. More acclamations. More ovations. But the public expects more than this. They want the fulfillment of all those pledges. Hitler cannot deliver. But he can and does dope his dupes with growing doses of anti-Semitism. He puts into effect his theory of racism, according to which only the 100% Aryan is worthy of living and propagating his kind in Germany. How different from the ideal are the leaders themselves. Hitler, thinking far ahead, sets out to capture the youth of Germany. But Hitler, who has made racism the foundation of National Socialism, cannot be sure that he himself is a true Aryan. His father was the natural son of a young woman named Schickelgruber. And he nearly came to bear that name himself. Could he have become the master of Germany if that had been the case? Instead of Heil Hitler, imagine the Nazi salute, accompanied by the ridiculous chant, Heil Schickelgruber. But as it happened, an old man, Johann George Hitler, at the age of 84, acknowledged as his son, Adolf Hitler's father. The illegitimate Alois Schickelgruber, at that time 39 years old. Was old Johann George Hitler really the man to whom Maria Anna Schickelgruber, the farm girl, had surrendered 40 years previously? Famous men, if they are Jews, are forced to flee their country. Three Nobel Prize winners. Einstein. James Frank. Freud. All have to go. And should the fever show signs of abating, it can readily be whipped up again. Shops are branded and then broken into. Wrecked. Plundered. Any attempted at resistance is a signal for a beating. A collective fine is imposed on all the Jews in Germany. A total sum running to millions of marks. Those who resist go to the dreaded Dachau concentration camp, where 100 die in the first five weeks. But in any case, the money is collected. The wealth thus confiscated is used to help meet the cost of Germany's colossal rearmament. Not all the money is used in this way. Some goes to line the pockets of Nazi leaders. on his complex character, guarded by his boy stormtrooper, he stands alone against this impressive background, face to face with the gigantic idol he has made of himself. If Hitler knows nothing of the sentiment common to mankind, it is because a single passion, all-absorbing, dominates him. He wants to be not only the greatest, the most powerful, but the only master. Even above God, whom he does not recognize, unless the clergy submits to his will. We do not want any other God, but Germany itself, cries Hitler. Goebbels echoes, God manifested himself, not in Jesus Christ, but in Adolf Hitler. Christ is a false prophet. He was a Jew, 
And Judaism is the source of all woes. All kinds of books are broadcast expounding the Nazi theory. Bolshevism, the fruit of Christianity. The fall of the gods. The Pope wants war. Catholic priests and Protestant clergymen, including the martyred Niemöller, are attacked or imprisoned when they resist the imposition of the Nazi theory upon their religion. Greater than the cross in Germany is the hooked cross. Hitler's power, symbolized by this cross, must be imposed everywhere, on everyone. And it even descends this cult of Hitler from a certain grandeur to the completely ridiculous. Heil Hitler! Heil Hitler! Heil Hitler! Heil Hitler! Heil Hitler! Heil Hitler. Heil Hitler. Heil Hitler. And so the people hail, and they fly the flags. Obedience and, and discipline. Sie gehen jedermann zu vertreten und zu schützen, um so mitzuhelfen am Aufbau eines wirklichen und besseren Friedens. So war uns Gott helfe. Grüßt eine Führung Feier. Sieg! 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 But for all the well orchestrated divisions, Hitler knows that he's not silenced all consciences. There are still those who would like to reach behind this living wall of machine-made enthusiasm. The only news that they get in their newspapers is Nazi news. And it is forbidden to listen in to foreign radio. The Nazis tried to create a Germany of just one opinion, one point of view. The human mind in quarantine. Punishment for listening in to foreign countries is severe. In the final resort, the penalty is death. The German newspapers themselves have announced sentences for this crime of penal servitude ranging from three and a half to five years. Crime of wanting to hear the truth. But the people do listen, and ingenious tricks are resorted to. Still parades, more parades, with Hitler now apparently assuming the role of a Nazi Nero. Maintains his torrent of oratory. That he and his 29 and reflect the film, then an interest focus of their talk of being. The wheel, then forgänglich, our Deutschland wird bestehen. We are going to sterben, our Deutschland must live, yes, or never. An orgy of ringing declarations. The German people have no thought of invading any country. The German government, like the German people, are filled with the unconditional wish to make the greatest possible contribution to the preservation of peace in this world. Hamburg, August 1934. Ten months later, Germany announced conscription. We want to be a peace-loving element among the nation. We cannot repeat that often enough. The first and best principle in our government's program is that we shall not lie. When have the German people ever broken their word? This is the man who solemnly promised to respect the Versailles Treaty and the Locarno Pact. On March the 7th, 1936, the German troops occupied the demilitarized zone of the Rhineland in violation of those treaties. May 1935. Germany neither intends nor wishes to interfere in the international affairs of Austria to annex Austria, or to conclude an Anschluss. Five months later, the Germans instigate riots in Vienna, and on July the 25th, they decide upon the murder of Chancellor Dolphus, who opposes the Anschluss. The Nazis masquerade in the uniforms of the regular Austrian army, seize the broadcasting station, and announce falsely 
that the Dolfus Ministry has resigned and that Grintelin, a pro-Hitler Austrian minister, has taken his place. Meantime, other Nazis have invaded the Chancellor and shot down Dolfus. He is carried into an office and placed on a settee. And for nearly four hours, he lies bleeding to death, deprived of any help whatsoever. There ensues one of the strangest, most poignant dramas of the days before the war. Is that you, Fay? Are you all right? Yes. So are the others. Well, I... I am going to die, and I just want you to look after my wife and children. Of course I will. You promise? I swear it. For the time being, our good friend Mussolini will look after them. We can trust him. Chancellor! I allowed Major Fay to come here so that you could speak to him on serious matters. The first and most important thing for you to do is to order the army to make no move against us. Send for a priest. Chancellor, you shall have a priest on conditions. Yes? Give immediate orders that Rintelin shall be placed at the head of the government and that the army shall take no action against us. I only want... Peace. No blood must be shed on my account. But Schusnick is the man to form a new government. I tell you, the man we insist upon having is Rintelin. The one man for Austria is Schusnick. No. Dolphus dies without yield. The Nazi attempt fails. Austria remains Austria. For the time being, an immense throng attends the state funeral of the little chancellor, and Cardinal Initzer, Archbishop of Vienna, declares, He endured the death throes of our Lord, surrounded by enemies. Austria's respite is only temporary. In March 1938, Hitler sends for Chancellor Schuschnigg and compels him to invite the Germans to take over Austria. German troops march into Vienna. The crime is consummated. Schuschnigg meets a fate almost worse than that of Dolphus. He is thrown into prison to face no one knows what torment. Cardinal Initzer sees his palace invaded and sacked by a fanatical mob of Hitler youth. of the church. You old humbug, you can't stop us. Get out of the way. Come on. Here you are. There's another one coming down. No, please. We have precious treasures of the church. Get out of the way. 
If he won't let him go, I'll kill him now, will it? The pace of events intensifies after the Austrian, the Sudetenland crisis. War seems inevitable. But the Pact of Munich establishes a new agreement. Hitler guarantees formally and solemnly Czechoslovakia's new frontiers. Czechoslovakia, faithful to her undertaking, relinquishes the Sudetenland territory to the troops of the Reich. The world breathes with relief. On the 26th of September, 1938, Hitler says of the Sudetenland, This territorial claim is the last I have to make in Europe. I have assured Mr. Chamberlain, and I repeat now, that when the Sudeten problem is settled, Germany will not raise any more territorial questions in Europe. Here are the words from the Fuhrer's very mouth. Mr. Chamberlain, <laughs> Within six months, the promise is broken. Czechoslovakia ceases to exist. And German troops enter Prague. In the same month, the ogre of Berlin swallows the mere morsel of memo, the Lithuanian port. Great Britain decides upon conscription, and Hitler is solemnly warned that any further act of aggression means war. The sands are running out. And August 1939 brings the most cynical stroke of all. Four years before, Hitler had declared, between Germany and Russia, there is a gulf that can never be bridged. But von Ribbentrop arrives in Moscow to sign a non-aggression pact between Hitler and Stalin. The astonishment aroused throughout the world is soon tinged with irony. So paradoxical is this new friendship between the two dictators. Current cartoons hit off the situation. I've changed my emblem a little just to please you. There's nothing new under the sun. Hitler and Stalin disguised as Frederick II and Catherine the Great. Germany is no less astonished than the rest of the world. Especially the older people who are unable to understand such a fantastic somersault. But Hitler has always concentrated on youth. The young people are his. Caught up in their earliest years, in the great Nazi machine. They think as Hitler wishes them to think. They will do only what Hitler wishes them to do. Their fanatical belief in their leader transcends all other considerations. Even family ties. Mother? Where are you going? Upstairs to my room. No. Stay here. There are things I must talk to you about. Oh, Mother, must we? Can't we leave it till later? No, later. I may find excuses for you. Later, I may even have begun to love you again. I want to speak to you now while I feel only contempt for you. While I see in you nothing but a despicable little spy. I 
got used to distrusting servants, strangers, even friends. But one's own child. No, that didn't seem possible. How could you bring yourself to do it? You must have hated your father. Why? I didn't hate him. I love him. Love? Yes. And I'm suffering as much as you are. Probably more. After all, I was the one who had to denounce him. Oh, oh they forced you. They suspected your father and questioned you. Threatened you, perhaps. Do you really think that I'd yield to threats? Well, it would have been an excuse. I don't need excuses. I don't understand. That's obvious. When Amy Anker informed on her mother, she didn't understand either. And when Franz Weber denounced his elder brother, his parents cursed him. Who are these people you're talking about? My comrades of the Hitler Youth. And yet, after denouncing her mother whom she adored, Amy Anker hanged herself, and Franz Weber tried to commit suicide. You see, they'd simply done their duty, knowing they'd pay for it with their lives. Duty? Is that what you call it? To spy on your own family? To betray those who love you? Is that what you call duty? So you're proud of what you did. You sneaked off to your leader and repeated your father's words of your own free will? Of course. You're mad. You're all of you mad. You don't understand anything that doesn't conform with your comfortable bourgeois ideas. All the time you use the words family and love. Well, you know what I think? If Germany is weak and poor and foreign countries don't respect her, it's your fault. Yours and other mothers like you. You can't make a nation strong by bringing up her children in the bourgeois atmosphere of the home, by softening their spirit with sloppy sentiment. I wish I'd never loved you, never loved father. Herman, Herman, don't. Don't, my little one. You don't know what you're saying. It's so terrible, these things you're telling me. It's horrible. Love is within the reach of any mere animal. The only sentiment that truly ennobles man is the spirit of sacrifice. Our Fuhrer has taught us that. That is why I despise your tales and why I'm proud of myself. I suppose that when I think of my father, I shall suffer sometimes. But I haven't any remorse. I know that I have no duties to anything but Germany. And I only live to serve her. Now, the final and greatest crime of all. Poland invaded. Open towns bombed. Over 350 ships mined, torpedoed, or bombed to the depths. Half of them innocent neutrals. Finland. Denmark. Norway. No people, however remote, are safe. Luxembourg. Holland. Belgium. Security vanishes from Europe. And still another crime. France, too, is laid in ruins and devoured by the war dogs of Europe. did Hess fly to the British Isles? Although it has not been officially admitted, the world now has reasons to believe that Hess came with a peace offer. Stop the war and join the Nazis in a joint war against the Soviet Union. Hitler faced another winter of war and starvation. Grab the Ukrainian wheat, 
grab that crew's oil and other materials of war. Attack Russia was the order. Another pledge broken. Another Hitler crime. Eastward, westward, where to next? Will this man be the master of your destiny? America answers no. quite a bit of time in Hitler, Germany, and who wrote a diary which had the good fortune to be read widely by a great many Americans, I've been asked by the Army-Navy Screen Magazine to talk about the film you're going to see. Well, the film is concerned with the Nazi youth movement. That is, it's about what Hitler has been able to do with the young people of Germany during the 12 years he's been in power. It's also enemy film captured on the Western Front only a very short time ago. Perhaps that's one of the remarkable things about these pictures. They're so terribly recent. This is not a film of five years ago, or even of two years ago. To be precise, this is training film photographed in the winter of 1944 and 45, when, by all ordinary standards, the Germans should be ready to quit. Germany cannot be defeated, their set faces say. Let the very old doubt. Let the seriously wounded and the mortally ill believe all is lost. But not they, the young people. They, the young, will not betray the sacred trust put in them by their fear of. They will still carry their banners high. And where, we ask, does this strength come from? Why are they so confident? Where does it begin? Here's where, and here, in this crib, or in a carriage where a baby lies, his mind like a fresh tablet, white and unruled. Anything can be written on that tablet, as the Nazis well know. So they begin their education for hate and death, war and conquest, by taking the child from his parents and turning him over to the Bund Deutscher Mädchen, a young girls' organization with over a million members, already dedicated to the principles of Nazism. We will not permit them to lapse into the old way of thinking Hitler has said of the children in these carriages. Instead, we will make them state children, and we will raise them according to plan. In Hitler, Germany, when a child is able to walk, he's also able to march and to carry a flag. I saw many such demonstrations as these during my years in Berlin, and still they go on. Children who learned to say gun, grenade, and stuka at an age when you and I were learning the meaning of words like cat, rat, and bat. And instead of playing with dolls, they're taught to make helmets. Who uses a helmet? A football player, yes, but also a tank man. Here again in this group of Jugend, as they're called, 
we get the meaning of total war. Here and these children, now a little older, and proudly exhibiting their swastikas, we see what the Nazis mean when they say that every member of the new generation must be brought under the spell of National Socialism. Today we know from the Nazis' loud boasts that there is no schoolboy, no apprentice working in the trade, whether a girl or a boy, who is not a member of some Nazi youth organization. In fact, such membership is compulsory, just as every young person is forced to dedicate himself to Hitler and the divine mission that Germany will one day rule the world. No, the young mind of the German child is no longer fresh and unruled. Hitler and the Nazis have marked it indelibly, black and deep with ideas we know belong to the Dark Ages, racial superiority, religious intolerance, and no respect for the rights of any people other than German. On the German report card, the word behavior has been changed to obedience. And here we see a group of Hitler youth being rewarded for their obedience and for the things they've learned, for knowing 141 experiments in gas and their antidotes, for knowing how to shoot not only a rifle, but a machine gun. At the same time, they're taken on strength through joy tours and shown German monuments. Much time is spent on Frederick the Great, for he too once had the combined strength of Europe against him. But his enemies failed to remain united, and Frederick the Great emerged triumphant. And these German children are made to believe that the same thing will again happen in this war, that the English and the Americans hate each other, and that they have a common enemy in Russia. Every nation knows that its future resides in its youth. But no nation has known it better than Germany under Hitler, and none has worked harder to impress its young people with the ideas of sacrifice. And that's why, after five years of war, after Germany's cities have been bombed mercilessly and six million of her soldiers lie dead, the youth of Germany still wish to serve Hitler and eagerly accept jobs aboard submarines as helpers. Nothing would excite and please these young Nazis more than to venture into hostile waters on such a ship and sink important Allied shipping. This is General Guderian, a German hero to whom Hitler has given great power. We can understand the importance of young people in the minds of the Nazis when we realize that these personal appearances are part of a German general's daily routine. The Darien must not only match his military skill against men like General Eisenhower and Marshal Zukov, but he must be ready at all times to impress upon the youth of Germany that Hitler is counting as much upon them as he is upon his armies. In the past, some have made the mistake of comparing various Nazi youth organizations with our own Boy Scouts and our YMCA. It's a bad comparison. This group of kids is not figuring out how to perform a good deed every day. They're not interested in helping a blind man cross the street or carrying an old woman's packages. This is war. These children know it, and they want more of it. Now we can begin to see why the German boy is so confident and why, when he learns the war is now being fought on sacred German soil, he is eager to volunteer for a labor battalion, eager to march off to dig the necessary tank traps and defense ditches. <laughs> On the Western Front, we've captured boys like this. Because they are boys, we have not believed they were dangerous or a threat to our military operations. Only gradually, and at a cost to American lives, have we learned that they are fanatical Nazis, ready to spy and sabotage. 
Some we have executed, and others we have sent to prison for life. Now they furrow all Germany with fortifications. But when the time comes, they're ready to stand behind them with the guns and machine guns they've learned to use so skillfully and efficiently. Here, in an unidentified German city, the Hitler youth of 18 is welcomed into the Wehrmacht. But the welcome is merely a formality, for there has been no real transformation from civilian life to army life, as there has been in our own country, in England, and in Russia. These men have never known the pleasures of a home, of a family, of going to church on Sunday, and of having a sweetheart that one day they plan to marry. The entire life of these men has been in a Hitler uniform. Hitler's order, stated clearly in Mein Kampf, have been obeyed. This is the German citizen of the next 25 years. This is the man who will still be a threat to any permanent peace when the guns have ceased firing. And it's because of them that the occupation of Germany is going to be one of our most difficult problems. These men are tough. We are going to have to be that much tougher if Americans don't want to be back in uniform in another 10 years, fighting Germany all over again.